I want to share a scripture with you today that I got from kind of an unusual source. And um, I was listening to this man speak on another subject I'll tell you about in a minute. And as I was, I could just sense the Lord is saying, that's a sermon. You can make a sermon out of that. So what I want to do is I want to start out by mentioning to you, letting you know, if you've ever done a word search, and probably not, not on this word, did you know the word consider is in the Bible, Old and New Testament, total, 97 times. And I didn't look up what in the Hebrew and the Greek what that word is, so I just went to Webster's for a general definition of the word consider. And it means to think carefully, especially with regards to taking action. And 97 times in the scriptures, God tells us to consider certain things. And I'm not going to read all 97 to you, but I just want to give you a sampling. Like in Job, chapter 37 and verse 14, God says, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Now poor Job, after all he's been through, God says, all right, with all that in mind, I want you to think. I want you to think carefully. And I want you to think carefully about taking some action when you consider all the wonderful works of God. In Psalm 41 and verse 1, it says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So if you are the kind of person that you have compassion when you hear about somebody else going through a hard time and you want to help, you reach out to help that person. You know what? When you come into a time of need, There'll be someone to help you. And then in Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, very interesting one. And this is the one I thought of when I was listening to this man's speech, and I'll explain it to you in a moment. But it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. So Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, I mean, he had a lot of time on his hands. He could do whatever he wanted. He was the richest man who ever lived, the wisest man who ever lived. And he was, he was getting into biology. And he was looking at entomology, looking at the, the insect world. And he was watching and studying an ant. Now, when was the last time you sat down and gave a lot of thought to an ant? <laughs> and I'm not talking about your Aunt Maud. I'm talking about those little things that crawl around on the ground. The only time we think about it is when they get in the house yeah. and they try to eat our food and we want to get rid of them. But Solomon says, consider them. So what he's basically saying is the animal kingdom, God's creation, I want you to consider that. I want you to take some deep, thoughtful consideration in regards to taking action in your life based on what you've learned from an ant. So with that in mind, I want to put that towards another one of God's creations. Because this man that I heard speak this week, he was talking about coyotes. Now, I know nothing about coyotes. I know we have them in Michigan like crazy now. Um, uh, last summer, Bobette's coming home down 16 mile, stuck in a traffic jam, and all of a sudden she looks, and there's this little wooded area, and there stands a coyote in the middle of the day. Rush hour traffic in Troy, Michigan. Last summer, I'm sitting in a Taco Bell parking lot. I know that takes you by surprise. <laughs> and I'm eating my lunch. And I got the windows rolled down, I'm listening to the radio, and I'm eating my burrito supreme, and out of the corner of my eye, there's this little wooded area, on Updike Road in downtown Auburn Hills, out comes a coyote. And that, that little bugger, he, he knew exactly, because Updike Road's pretty busy. He was standing in the woods, I didn't see him when he was doing this, and he was looking at the traffic, because he knew exactly when was the right time, because he came out of the woods and he took off. He, he was, looked like he was running 60 miles an hour right across Updike, ran across the street, jumped over something, and disappeared into another small area of woods. They're all over the place. So that's about all I knew about coyotes. So when he said, I want to teach you about coyotes, I thought, well, this will be interesting. 
Did you know, in 1817, the governor of Arizona, I didn't catch his name, who he was, but coyotes are very um, troublesome, you know, pestilences. They cause all kinds of troubles and problems, and they're little pests, and they will eat your small animals. Eat chickens and sheep and dogs and all kinds of things. Well, in Arizona and just a few other states in the western part of the country, they had coyotes. So the governor of Arizona went to the president and he said, can I get this federal law that we want to get rid of these guys? So we want to make it a law that it's open hunting season on coyotes anytime, day or night, all year long. And we want to just eradicate coyotes from the face of the earth. And the president said, okay. So since 1817, coyotes, open hunting season on coyotes. Well, they got rid of all the coyotes, right? No. As a matter of fact, there's more coyotes in the country than ever before in history. Out of the 50 United States, coyotes are in 49 of them. There's only one state they're not in, and that's because they haven't learned how to swim to Hawaii yet. So you put a coyote on a boat, and I'll bet you there's going to be coyotes over there. Other animals, you've got to tiptoe around them, you've got to treat them with kit gloves, and they go extinct on you. Coyotes, you say, let's purposely eradicate them, and they just won't die. They just won't give up. So this person was talking about some of the traits of coyotes, and I'm thinking, that's a sermon. So God tells us to consider the ant. So today, my sermon is entitled, Consider the Coyote. So I want you to consider three traits about coyotes and see how that relates to our lives today. The first one, the first trait of coyotes that, so that you can't eradicate them, is that they're adaptable. Their adaptability. They will adapt to anything. You know, we are creatures of habit. We like our creature comforts. We like our comfort zones. What we hate is change. Because change means we're going into the unknown and we don't like the unknown. We like the way things used to be. Well, I got news for you. The only thing in this life that never changes is change. It's, everything is changing constantly. Have you ever gone back to the home you grew up in as a child? It don't look nothing like it did before. It might not even be there. And everything is changing. Now, coyotes, they adapt to change. They're not worried about it. They'll adapt to any kind of situation at all. You know, you know what a delicacy is for coyotes, what they love to eat? They love groundhogs. But if a coyote can't get a groundhog, he'll eat any kind of small animal. If a coyote can't get a small animal and he can't get meat, a coyote will eat fruits. He'll eat vegetables. He'll even eat trash laying around. He's going to adapt to whatever the situation is, and he's going to eat. Coyotes are basically nocturnal, but Bobette and I saw them in the middle of the day. They'll come out in the middle of the day if that's what it's going to take to find food. Now, we see change as a bad thing. And to be honest with you, some changes taking place in the world are bad. You know, I went back to work Friday for the first time in nine weeks because I was sick before this whole shutdown happened. So I haven't been to work in nine weeks. And Friday was my first day back. And you know what shocked me? Every day when I drive to work, I get off M59 on Updike Road, and I go past what used to be the old Pontiac Silverdome. Well, when I left nine weeks ago, they had been working on the ground. I mean, the Silverdome was gone, and they'd been working on the ground. It was just a big open field. When I went back on Friday, you know what's there? Have you seen the Amazon building over here in 23 in Shelby? There's two Amazon buildings there that make this one look like a telephone booth. Mm -hmm. They're gigantic. They just popped up in nine weeks. Talk about change. Mm -hmm. Now, my humble opinion, you may agree or disagree, mm -hmm. 
I know it's very convenient to go on the computer and look up anything from doorknobs to toasters, and you can order one on Amazon and have it in two days. But I personally don't think that's a good thing. So many ma and pa stores going out of business, so many people wanting to make a living being entrepreneurs and starting their own business, they can't compete with these big giant conglomerations like this. So there's some changes that I think aren't good, but when you think that all change is bad and you say, I'm not moving forward, I'm going to just keep everything the way it was in the past, you're going to be a very frustrated, unhappy person because you can't go back. Like the old saying, you can never go home. You can't go back to the way things used to be. You just can't. So change is not going away. So we might as well think like a coyote and then learn to adapt to it. Now I'm not saying adapt to the changes that are evil. You know, we have to have this mentality that we're going to survive. But not only are we going to just survive, we're going to thrive. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. We can thrive even in the future, even with changes, because you've got to think like a coyote. Coyotes could have said, oh boy, they're going to kill me. I guess I better lay down and die. But they said, you ain't killing me. And they're tricky little buggers. And they just kept exploding. Well, you know what? We can't just lay down and die. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, Paul said, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through all things, even through things coming in the future that we don't know what we're facing, we don't have to face it with fear. No matter what happens down the road, I'm going to face it with Jesus, and I'm not only going to just survive, I'm going to thrive. I'm not just going to be a conqueror, I'm going to be more than a conqueror. Got to ask you a question, and you can shout it out to me. I want to ask you a question. Does anybody here know what the shape of a stop sign is? Octagon. 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 It's got eight sides, right? Okay. Does anybody know what color a stop sign is? Red. The red. Okay. Good. By the way, you're right. All right. Now I got another question for you. <clears throat> Does anybody know what uh, shape a yield sign is? Triangle. Triangle. A triangle. <clears throat> Does anybody know what color they are? Yellow. yellow. What color are they? Red. Yellow. <laughs> I got a yellow and I got a red. Did you know that yield signs have been red ever since 1986? <clears throat> if you see a yellow yield sign, it's an old one. It's very old. Go on Google Images. I did it to test this guy out and I typed it in. And sure enough, yield signs are red. But in my mind, I think of them as yellow. Yeah. And what we get from this is we don't like change because we remember things the way they were. Change means, oh no, I'm facing the future and I don't know what that's like. And I don't want to be in, out of my comfort zone. We can't be afraid to adapt. In Philippians 4.13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That means not just the past, not just the present, but in the future. We have to learn how to adapt and be willing to say, whatever I'm going to face, I can handle it. I can do all things through Christ, and He's the one that's going to strengthen me. The thing about change is... During change, things change. But in a change, we human beings have two options. We can get all tied up in a knot and say, oh, I like the way things used to be. You know? Do you remember when there was only three channels on the TV? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there was two, four, seven, and nine. And then they came out with this um, VHF converter and you can get 50, 56, and 62. Wow, you were really living high off the hog. But when you wanted to change the channel, you had to get up, walk across the room, and turn it on. We thought that was great. Did you know that our grandparents thought televisions, this is terrible. 
because they lived with radios. Every time there's a change, the previous generation says, this is terrible. Talk to a millennial person and tell them about an 8-track tape. <laughs> They're going, what? Oh yeah, there's these big giant things that look like a shoebox. You'd plug it in, and if you wanted to hear the same song, you had to drive around the block because you couldn't go backward or forward. You had to just, and remember, they never worked. You had to cut a piece of cardboard and jam it in there so it wouldn't bounce around when your car hit a bump. We have two options when change comes. And it's not, you're going to not stop change. It's not if it comes, but when it comes. We can fight it and say, I want to go back in the past. Or change can cause us to improve. And we can learn. And we can, we can grow better at it. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God is calling all of us into the future. And it's not back into the future with um, your DeLorean flying back to 1987. I'm talking about the future. He's calling us into the future. And He wants a group of people that are willing to adapt. Now, the message of the gospel must never change. But our methods might have to change. And as long as it's nothing immoral, unscriptural, or illegal, we need to adapt. Because that's the world that we're living in. The second trait of a coyote is they're courageous. They're not afraid of anything. They do whatever it takes to keep moving forward. We have to be open to new ideas, like I said. Now, when I first became a Christian, I worked at a church that was not a Bible-believing church. Big Gothic church, and I worked in the maintenance staff, and then later became the head of maintenance, and then became the verger. And I saw a lot of things that grieved my spirit. And um, But this church didn't believe the Bible was the actual Word of God. They thought it was a storybook that you could learn from, but you weren't supposed to take it literally. And I remember after one of the sermons, this priest came down off the pulpit. He was so proud of himself. And I talked to him in the vesting room when we were changing afterwards. And um, I was telling him where he was wrong scripturally. And he says, you know what your problem is, Dave? He says, you're just too narrow-minded. you got to be open-minded. And I said, what, open-minded like a sewer? <laughs> he didn't like that. I wasn't real good at making friends and influencing people back then. And I said, Jesus told me narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. I need to be narrow-minded. Now, I'm not talking about scriptural, spiritual things. I'm never going to sway from the fact that I'm narrow-minded in the fact that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only way to the Father. And I don't care what changes around me, I'm never changing that fact. But I'm talking about change in the way we just function and we do things. We need to be open-minded. Because God is willing and able to give us new ideas. I remember I read a book, I think it was like 1988, and it was called Your God is Too Small by J.B. Phillips. And in the first chapter, he, he asked this question of a bunch of uh, high school kids. Now, this is in like 1988, so the high-tech world was not then what it is now. But he asked these high school kids, he said, do you think God understands computers? And the majority of them said no. They don't think their God is too small. They don't think God understands computers. Well, just imagine how far technology has come since 1988. Do you think God understands technology? Do you think God knows how to program your cell phone? Do you think He knows the difference between 5G and 4G? I mean, all. The, do you think He knows? Absolutely He does. And God's not afraid of change. And God's not afraid to give us ideas. In Jeremiah 
33 and verse 3. One of my favorite scriptures. It says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I've told you this story before, but it's been a while. George Washington Carver, a black man who had obtained his freedom in this country, and he was a very godly man. And now that he's free, he says, he's praying, he says, Lord, I want to know everything about you. I want to know what you've got planned for my life. I want to know everything there is to know about you. And one day the Lord spoke to him and said, you can't even begin to comprehend half of what everything about me. He says, but I'm going to teach you just a little bit about a peanut. And George Washington Carver spent the rest of his life learning about peanuts. He invented um, all these different combines and machines where you could harvest peanuts faster and easier. He learned fertilizers and ways to grow peanuts better. He invented peanut butter. And with all the money that he made, he could, he could uh, hire all these freed black slaves. And he was the first person to open up a college just for freed black men and women. And he did so well in life that the United States Congress asked him to come and speak and say, how did you come up with all these ideas? And I'm obviously paraphrasing, but he basically said, all credit and glory goes to God. And he quoted Jeremiah 33.3. God knows everything. He's omniscient. And he's willing to give us ideas that nobody else ever knew. Now, there's, I've told you the story before, there's a mentality we can have. And I told you the story about when I took guitar lessons from that one teacher and he had a cartoon taped on the music stand. You can't teach somebody something that already knows everything. And if we have, oh, I don't want to know anything else. I know everything. I know all I need to know. You can't teach that person anything. But if you're just like a sponge and you say, Lord, I want to know everything. I want to know everything you want to teach me. You're charging me, unless I die in my sleep tonight, you're charging me to wake up tomorrow, which is the future. Today is tomorrow's yesterday. So you're wanting me to face the future. I need to know how to do that. Because the world around me is changing so quickly. Every invention, every idea, when it first comes out, they can be used for good or for evil. When the radio first came out, people thought, this is the devil's machine, this is evil. All these people hearing these radio programs and commercials, trying to sway them away from God. They're staying home instead of going to church on Sunday. They want to stay home and listen to the radio. This is terrible. Until one day, I don't know his name, who it was, but some preacher said, I'm going to use this radio and I'm going to preach the gospel on there. And he did. And who knows how many thousands, if not millions of people throughout history have been saved by listening to somebody on the radio. What about GPS? Global Positioning Satellites. Oh, they're evil because they're going to just zoom in on us and track us down and know where we are at all times. And you know what? You're right. Because I've read the book of Revelation and eventually with the mark of the beast and the number of the beast that... And in your cell phone right now, they can track you anywhere you want to go. But you know what else you can use global positioning satellites for? Airwaves. And those satellites can transmit pictures all over the world. So you could be sitting in your house, drinking Bosco in your recliner, watching TV, and see what's going on in Ecuador. See, I'm going back in history, Bosco. Nobody time. knows something <laughs> going on that. But you know what? In the book of Revelation, it says there's going to be these two guys called the two witnesses, and I believe it's Elijah and Enoch, and they're going to come into the streets of Jerusalem and preach the everlasting gospel, and the whole world's going to see it. How's that going to happen? The whole world's going to see it because of global positioning satellites. And then... They're going to die. They're going to be killed. And their dead bodies are going to lay in the streets for three days. And then they're going to rise from the dead, and they're going to be raptured. 
and the whole world's going to see it because of global positioning satellites. So technology can be used for good or for evil. New ideas can be used for good or for evil. You give me a hundred dollars, and I dare you to give me a hundred dollars, <laughs> but I can take that hundred dollars and I can go buy some drugs, some alcohol, a prostitute, I can go buy a gun, I can do whatever I want with that, or I can take that same hundred dollars and I can buy shoes for somebody who doesn't have any shoes. I can buy food for some widow that doesn't have enough food to feed her children. I can give that money to a ministry that can go preach the gospel and get somebody into God's kingdom. Money is an inanimate object. Yeah, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, the love of money is. But money itself is an inanimate object. Yeah. It's a green piece of paper with a picture of a dead president on it. <laughs> Lay it on the ground. It can't do nothing. It's what you do with it. So if we say, oh, we don't need any more technology, we don't need any more inventions, then don't worry, God won't bother you with giving you any ideas. But if you say, I want to know what God wants to teach me, and then use it for the good, no matter what you think of, it can be used for evil or good. This building has been a lot of different things. You know this part that you're sitting in right now used to be a party store. They probably even sold beer and wine and whiskey somewhere in here. But we took this building and we're preaching the everlasting gospel. Everything can be used for good and evil. Amen. So if you say, well, you know, I don't want that. We have to learn how to think out of the box. Don't think ordinary. I heard somebody say the other day, I heard this quote, it says, find out what everybody else in the world is doing and then don't do it. That's how you think out of the box. In Romans 12, 2, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't do things like the world does. Have your mind renewed. Just think, what would you do if you knew without a shadow of a doubt you couldn't fail? God can give you the ideas to do that. All right, I want you to listen for a minute. Listen. Do you hear it? Right now, this very moment floating around is a new idea for a new business that's going to make somebody a multimillionaire. But someone's going to obtain it. There's all some right now. Listen, there's a cure for some kind of disease. There's some idea that could change the world. But we have to be open to it. So oh, I don't want change. I don't. The coyote is courageous. He's not afraid. When when they said after 1817 we're going to kill all those coyotes, they said, Oh yeah, bring it on. You ain't killing me. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, we know this one very well. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. We always say, well, God's not given me the spirit of fear. But when we talk about the future, when we talk about the book of Revelation, people just tense up and they get afraid because the future is unknown. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Think like, consider the coyote. We don't have to be afraid. And then the third characteristic of coyotes is they never quit. They just won't give up. Did you know, you know, like, um, I, I guess they still have them, but they used to have, like, bear traps. And they, it was like these oh, two yeah. giant jaws, and they'd open them up and then set it, and there was put a piece of meat in the middle of it, and when the bear or the animal would catch on it, it would clap up on them and catch their leg or whatever. Well... They did that for many, many years trying to catch coyotes, but they stopped. You know why? Because if a coyote gets caught in a trap, you know what he'll do? He'll chew his leg off. He says, you know, if, if I got caught in one of those, you know, that's it, I'm going to die. But the coyote says, not me, I'll chew that. i got three more legs. I'll chew that leg off. He says, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. You know that there's... All kinds of three-legged coyotes running around. They even found one coyote that had both his front legs gone, and he was hopping around like a kangaroo. And then they found one coyote 
that had lost his front and back leg on the right side. So when he would run, he learned how to balance himself, and he could run on just the two legs on the front and back on the left side. They found a coyote in the upper part of, um, near the upper peninsula of Michigan that didn't have a bottom jawbone. Somehow he must have tried to eat what was in that trap, and the jaw got caught in the trap, and he pulled away and ripped his bottom jaw off. And he ran around without a bottom jaw, and he healed, he got strong, and he learned how to eat with just his upper teeth. Coyotes just don't give up. That's what we have to do. we got to have that mentality. I'm not going to give up. No matter if life is good, bad, easy, hard, I'm not giving up. And I've told you before, the, the Greeks, they have a saying, they don't write obituaries about people. They just ask when somebody died, did they live with passion? And we need to live with passion. Think about it. You know, I sell refrigerators for a living. I want to be the best refrigerator salesman in the world that I possibly can, but it's not my driving goal in life. Just think, as a Christian, for lack of a better term, we have the best product there is. It's called salvation. If you meet this guy Jesus and surrender your life to him, you can live forever. You want to be wealthy? Man, talk about a retirement plan. Half of his kingdom belongs to you. And you live forever and you're never going to have any pain. We got the best product. It's called salvation in Jesus. If anybody should be passionate about selling something and promoting something, it should be us. Whatever we are called to do, we should be amazing at it. And like I said, I'm not all excited about selling refrigerators, but I'm doing pretty good, and I'm trying to be the best I can. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Don't just work hard when your boss is looking at you. Work as hard as because Jesus... Did you ever see that bumper sticker, my boss is a Jewish carpenter? <laughs> well, he's always looking at you. Work heartily as unto the Lord, because if you're faithful in little things, you'll be given much. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Sometimes life is tough. Sometimes it's hard. Bad things happen to good people. And if we say, well, that's not fair. I give up. I quit. You can do that. But if you think like a coyote, you never give up. No matter what happens. If life is easy or life is hard. If I like what I'm going through or I don't, I ain't giving up. I'm a coyote. I'm never going to give up. Now, I heard some quotes this week. Well, one, a couple of them I've heard many times, but a new one I heard this week. And they're secular quotes. So just keep that in mind. But I have scripture to back them up. And I'm saying these for a reason. It says, at the moment of commitment, the universe conspires to assist you. You know, people can say, well, I wish I had one of those. Or I hope someday I can do that. Or if only I had that. Or if only I would have done this. You know what that accomplishes? Nothing. But if you make a commitment, I'm going to commit to stop doing this, start doing that, obtain this, get rid of that. You make a commitment, the second you do, everything around you conspires like, hey, we got we got to assist this person. They're not kidding around. The other one, you've heard me say many times before, it's not scripture, but it kind of is. It says, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. God's looking for people who have some backbone, who are willing to stand up against all the odds and say, I'm moving forward. If you're bold, I believe God says to his angelic kingdom, look at, look at that fool down there. He doesn't even realize what he's getting himself into. We better rush and help him out. And mighty forces will come to your aid. And then this one by Henry Ford. And you've heard me say it before. Whether you believe you can, or whether you believe you can't, you're right. Oh, well, I could never do that. You're right, you couldn't. Well, I can do that. You're right, you can. I was watching something about Henry Ford the other day, and um, 
I never knew this. Did you know that when Henry Ford started the Ford Motor Company, he had to get permission from an organization called ALAM, A-L-A-M, and it stood for the American, I think it was League, I can't remember what the second letter was for, but the American League of Automotive Manufacturers. And they held a patent on the, emo on, on the automotive, or on the automobile. And nobody could manufacture automobiles unless you had this conglomerate's permission. So Henry Ford went to them and said, hey, here's my plan. It's called a Model A. I'd really like to build this. And they, three months later, they said, nope, denied. You can't do it. And he says, well, I'm not going to let them tell me what to do. So he started building them, and he started selling them. And he started to do pretty good. So the, this Alum, they sued him. Very powerful conglomeration. They sued him. And guess what? He fought him in court, and he won. Did you ever hear of the Ford Motor Company? <laughs> He said, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you're right. Now, this is a secular guy who's not a Christian. He was a 33rd degree Mason. But he had that mindset. And you know where it came from? I don't know if he knows this, but in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Solomon says he's watched human nature. Everything starts with the way we think. Did you ever hear the old saying, Stinking thinking. It all depends on the way we think. And Jesus, do you think Jesus knows anything about human nature? This is what Jesus said in Mark 9.23. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now that's not speak it into existence and name it and claim it. No. You know, 90% of what's done is... 10% is inspiration and 90% is perspiration. It's hard. you got to work. But if you believe you can do something and you want something, you can accomplish it. you got to have that never give up mindset. Now, I want to do something with you. You may think I'm crazy, but I just want to prove a point. All right, everybody's sitting down, right? Okay, I want you to raise your right hand in the air. Okay? Now I want you to still stay seated. I want you to raise your right hand as high as you can. Okay, now I want you to raise just a little bit more. All right, put your hands down. You look silly. <laughs> Did you notice something? I said, raise your right hand. Everybody went about this high. Few went a little higher. And I said, raise it as high as you can. They went this high. But what, I said, raise it as high as you could. And you went like this. And I said, raise it a little bit more. And almost everybody raised it a couple inches higher. I thought you already raised it as high as you could. The point I'm getting across is we are capable of so much more than we think we are. And it's stinking thinking. Oh, I could never do that. You're right, you can't. Jesus said in the last chapter of Mark, He said, these are the signs that will follow them that believe. I'm not saying this. Jesus is. You'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You'll speak in new tongues. Oh, I, I could never speak in tongues. I don't believe in that. Okay, you won't be bothered with it. He won't make you. But if you believe, you will. Oh, I could never lay hands on somebody and they'd be healed. I, I, I just, I don't, I could do Oh, well, then don't waste your time. Don't do it. But he says, these are the signs that will follow them that believe. And I know this is a long stretch, but a coyote, if coyotes could pray for people, they, they would. They just won't give up. You can't stop a coyote. We limit ourselves all the time. But the worst kind of limitation is when we attribute that limitation to God. And we say, oh, I could never do that because I don't think God wants me to. And we limit what we believe God can and wants to do in our life. If it's not immoral and it's not illegal and it's not unscriptural, think out of the box. Ask God, what do you want me to do? You know, there's an old statement. I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was Thoreau or Hemingway. But somebody said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. We just go through the mundane things of life and say, well, I don't like this, but I guess I have to. Says who? And you know, God is unlimited. Ask yourself this question. What could you do if you decided to? What could you do? 
All things are possible to him that believeth. Now, no, you can't jump off the Empire State Building, flap your wings hard enough and fly. All right, let's be realistic. But I mean within human, like if I would have asked you sitting in your chair to touch the ceiling, you can't do that. That's an unrealistic goal. But you could sit there and raise as high as you could. We need to stretch ourselves. Coyotes, they're adaptable. They're courageous and they never give up. We're living in an extraordinary times. And extraordinary times need and demands extraordinary actions. we got to think out of the box. I want to share a scripture with you about two guys in the book of Acts named Paul and Silas. These two guys traveled all over Asia and they did incredible miracles. Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel with signs and wonders following. And read the book of Acts. Some of the things that they've done were amazing. Well, they went into this one town and the people got scared. So they went to the leader of that town, his name was Jason. And they said, what are we going to do? These guys are here. And in Acts 17, verse 6, it said this, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They referred to Paul and Silas, human beings just like me and you, as guys who turned the world upside down. They're wrong, because in reality they were turning the world right side up. The world's already upside down. If you watch the news, the world's going nuts. Chaos everywhere. And they want chaos, because out of chaos comes order. A new world order. It's purposeful, it's planful. What we have to do as Christians is we have to think like a coyote. We're going to be adaptable. You know, I don't want to scare you, but there's a war against Christians. We don't see it as much in this country as other parts of the world, but we're starting to see the glimpses and glimmers of it. When those coyotes heard in 1817 it's open hunting season on them, they didn't get together and say, well, guys, might as well just have a big party and lay down and die. They're going to kill us. There's no hope. They said, uh-uh, not us. Well, we as Christians, are we going to lay down and die? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. we got to be adaptable. we got to say, if we're going to meet in a big building, a small building, in somebody's garage, in somebody's house, we're going to meet. We're going to be the church. And we're not giving up. we got to be adaptable. we got to think like a coyote. Now I'm going to share three quick stories with you, and then I'm done. The first one... Is some of us, I don't want to scare you, some of us are getting older. And we say, well, that sermon was for all the young kids. Let them young whippersnappers think about the future. I don't have much of a future. All right? I don't want you to raise your hand, but there's a few in this room that are over 80. Okay? And when you're 80, you say, well... Yeah. Point another man three score a year and ten and another ten for strength eighty. I'm like I'm living on borrowed time. Well, Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, God Almighty appeared to an eighty year old farmer, an eighty an eighty year old shepherd in Midian. His name was Moses. And he says, Hey Mo, come here. I got a job for you. And Moses says, What are you talking about? I'm old. I'm, on the, I'm getting ready on the retirement plan. I'm going to take care of a few more sheep and I'm just going to chill out. He says, no, I got the biggest assignment for you you've ever had in your whole life. I want you to go back to the most powerful nation in the world and stand eyeball to eyeball with the most powerful man on earth and say, let my people go. So you may say, well, I don't know. I'm too old to accomplish anything. Are you still breathing? If you're breathing... Yeah, but my body hurts, and I don't have much money, and I don't have much strength. Well, it might take you a little longer to do what God wants you to do. <laughs> but like the old saying, death is God's way of telling you it's time to slow down. If you're still breathing, everything I said still applies to you. Now, the other story is, and I'm tempted to say I apologize, but I'm not going to, because it's too applicable. Okay, you ready? In Rocky 1, 
the end of the movie, he's sitting on the bed, talking to Adrian. And he goes, yo, Adrian. He says, I can't do it. Nobody's ever beat Creed. He says, but you know what? No one's ever gone the distance either. And he says, if I can just keep standing, and when that last bell rings, I'm still standing, I'll know for the first time in my life I just weren't some bum from the neighborhood. Can you tell I've seen that movie once or twice before? <laughs> and he went in there and he got his brains beat in. But when that last bell rang, he was standing. And you know what? We gotta think like a coyote. And I'm gonna adapt to whatever I have to adapt to. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'm fighting for my eyesight, I'm fighting for my hearing. And, um, you know, all of us are forgetting things more than we used to. By the way, you want to you wanna increase your mental powers, learn something new. Learn how to basket weave. Learn how to play the tuba. Learn something new. Let the cells in your brain come alive with something new. Never give up. We can't give up. The only way you can fail is to quit. Mm -hmm. And if you don't quit, you can't fail. And when this life is over, I'm not giving up until Jesus either raptures me out of here or says, come on, Davy boy, you're too old. Let's get out of here. But I ain't giving up. Never. You put me in a nursing home and if I'm blind and I'm deaf, which I rebuke, I don't want that, but I'm going to preach the gospel to whoever's there. And, I mean, we all saw that horrendous video of that guy that they put in the nursing home that had COVID-19 and he went around beating up the patients. If that happens to me, I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus and ask for an angel to protect me and then I'm going to preach the gospel of that guy and get him saved. Whatever we have to face, we have to have the mindset, I'm a coyote. I'm going to adapt. And I'm courageous. I'm not going to, oh no, what's going to happen in the future? I know what's going to happen in the future. Me and Jesus are going to be there together. And I'm never going to give up. Never, ever, never, 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 ever give up. Now many times I want to quit. But it's just an emotion. you got to have that commitment. So, with all that being said, when you're going through a hard time, Consider the coyote. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your animal kingdom. You told Job, consider the works of God. And the animal kingdom are all the works of God. And we have things to learn from anything that you've created. And Lord, give each one of us that, that ability and that willingness to adapt. <laughs> Yeah, we all wish we could go back to the way things were, but that's not realistic. We all wish that we could just, life was more fair, but it's not realistic. we got to be courageous. we got to be adaptable. And Lord, give us all that spirit, like Paul said, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Because Lord, every single Christian that's listed in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, Every Christian that was eaten by the lions in Nero's circus. Every Christian that was crucified or impaled on a stick. If we talk to them now, they're all going to say it was worth it. So Lord, I don't want any of those things to happen to any of us. But whatever I face, two things. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. And I ain't never, never, never going to give up. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.